Hey friends, you're watching Brainstorm Makers. I'm Henry. And I'm Irene. We're going to talk about aphids. So much fun. We don't usually have trouble with aphids here. If we do, it's usually not until like July or August, kind of that end of the season thing when... We're in June or July now, aren't we? No. No? No. May or June? No. No? April. <laughs> They're really early this year. Now, earlier this year, you may have seen that we had a small infestation in the greenhouse uh -huh. from some aphids that were brought in with some plants that we were given. No harm, no foul. We kept those <laughs> under control and... Those are pretty much gone, but we discovered something new in the yard. Right, black aphids. So the ones we had in the greenhouse were actually sort of a yellowy orange color. And uh, the ones in the yard are distinctly a black aphid. So those are the ones that we usually get, like I say, July or August, sometimes not until September. We find them on a couple of the wild weeds, which I refuse to allow to grow in the yard for that reason. And then once in a rare while, they come through on something weird, like uh, they like, they don't seem to like bush beans, but they will go for some of the Asian um, pole beans. And they will also go for peppers. Yeah, so, now, we, we noticed when we went out in the yard that these aphids went after something that we've never seen aphids on before. Ever. Ever. ever anywhere. anywhere in the United States. And that's the iris. The iris have aphids all over them. And what's weird is usually, see, like, I know some people will look at, like, my iris beds and say, oh, you should clean all the debris at the end of the season. Well, we happen to know that usually ladybugs overwinter in the debris in those, gar in those beds. So we actually purposefully leave it until we start to see real growth activity in the spring because that way those aphids have something to hide under. So when we get a night, you're, you're talking about I mean, the those um, ladybugs. ladybugs have something no, we to don't, hide. We don't need the we aphids don't need to the, hide yeah, under no. anything. And there, there is a disadvantage that sometimes you'll get something like a shield bug or a squash bug that will also overwinter. But mostly the the work that the ladybugs do more than offsets any other things that may manage to also hide in there. So this year, so far, I am seeing almost no ladybugs outside, and that's very unusual for us because we have always encourage them and we don't squash any larvae that we find and we have actually brought them in on a couple of occasions so yeah. i was actually thinking about picking some up yesterday because we had to go to flagstaff for some medical appointments it ended up taking literally all day we didn't get out of the physician's office until 7 30 a quarter till 8 we got home 10 30. 10.30, so it yeah. was a long day. Yeah. Unfortunately, though, that meant that the hardware store where we'd normally pick up the ladybugs was completely closed. Right, I'm not sure they would actually have them quite yet. Well, that's the other problem. It's a lot colder in Flagstaff, so there's probably not a real need up there for not yet. ladybugs. Not yet. And actually, I've been doing a little bit of reading because um, sometimes in the past when we've bought ladybugs, they have really stayed around and done a great job and sometimes they've been gone in a couple of days uh, i did not realize that they were very temperature sensitive so for us when it gets hot the ladybugs will flee they'll go they may be outside but they won't stay in the greenhouse for instance they go fly away yeah, that's right they go find a nice shady spot someplace <laughs> uh probably up in the mountains where it's cooler not here not here so uh we have those other alternatives and one of the things I always try and do when I find bugs is not just automatically squash them. I try and always know what I'm squashing because you always feel bad if you find out you squash somebody, squash somebody that was on your side later. Uh, There's all manner of beneficial insects, some of which are natural in our area, some of which aren't. But you know, there's some easy ways to start controlling aphids early on mm -hmm. in their onslaught. Right, right. And that is, you can literally blast them off with soap and water. Mm -hmm. Now, I haven't used this much in a very long time, but you can use Castile soap or 
I think done dishwashing liquid. Probably works they, well. a lot of people will use like a Dr. Bronner's. They, most people who use something like that try to use a fairly natural soap. I have used the uh, insecticidal soaps before that are specific. They stink. God, they stink. But they, uh, you know, they do a good job. They do have some of them have pyrethrin in it. Some are just soap. Um, but you know, just plain ordinary Castile soap works. Mm -hmm. It works on two levels. First, it blasts the aphids off the plant, which salvages some of what the plant wants to do. And the other thing is that soap is a surfactant, which means that it breaks the surface tension of the body of the insect. It's a soft-bodied insect in this stage, which means it's vulnerable to all manner of things. Mm -hmm. Anytime you're dealing with soft-bodied insects, you have a lot more options than once they've gotten to be crunchy. <laughs> once they're crunchy, you have to really do something that will mess them up. Soap. Some people find luck with things like uh, emulsions made from oh, peppermint oil and other kinds of natural oils that are smelly. You know, it's usually the aromatic oils that they... Some people feel it confuses them. Some people feel it just repels them. I have used, like I say, the insecticidal soap before. I have used in a pinch just blasting them off with a hose and smooshing them with your fingers. I mean, you know... Ew, they can't. They're slimy. They're slimy. But they're not as slimy as some of the other things I've squashed. So, yeah, it's not it's not particularly nice. You can wear gloves and, and you know, like nitro gloves is a good choice because then you just throw them away when you're done. What did you do with your thumb? Oh, that's a, that's a remnant from our car accident. I got a new brace from the doctor yesterday, so... This is going to... Hold up so people can see it. Ta-da! It's lovely. <laughs> That's what a couple of hours of our day yesterday was spent on. Right, he was sitting there playing with a... Um, what do you call it? Uh, ultrasound. Ultrasound, He's yeah. using point-of-care ultrasound so yeah. that he could actually look through her skin and look at the soft tissues and mm -hmm. see a little bit of the hard tissue. And he was, he was, what he was doing is he was, he'd, have, he'd move my thumb in a specific way to be able to watch the joint to see how much of a gap and how much it was... Yeah, it didn't hurt too bad when I went in, but it might, it's feeling a little beat up today because it's kind of like, is this, does this hurt? You know, yes, it does. <laughs> a few moments later. Uh, yeah, I, I had another threatening phone call yesterday oh, yeah. telling me they were going to take turn off my electricity. Yeah, that's from PG&E. Pacific Gas and Electric, that's California. We're not California. And right. I love getting the emails and the phone calls. They're easy to ignore. <laughs> yes, it just makes we me laugh. We don't reply to them. We don't do anything with them because if you do, they're going to continue coming after you because they're scammers. They're trying to yeah, steal Yeah, it's not actually pg and &E. I did look up aphids. I know there's all different kinds. There's different names for them. Did you realize there's more than 1,300 types of aphids? Mm -hmm. And just in the U.S. and Canada, that's not counting the rest of the world. That's a lot of mm -hmm. mean insects. Right. They, they said that about 80 species are pests for food crops and ornamental plants, and they usually name them over what they attack. The first thing you want to do is you really want to identify the type of aphid you have because there's some things that will work well against some types of aphids. There's others that will work better on others. So the first thing, step is you want to identify that it actually is an aphid. Yeah, well that's that's one of the things they tell you. If, if you find, you, if your plant is being chewed on, then it's not an aphid. It's something else because aphids don't chew. They suck. They're suckers. Yep. They literally just stick a stick a proboscis sort of thing into the... They stick the nose in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a tube into your plant and suck the juice out of it. So... The big problem with them is that they can transfer disease. The biggest trick with a lot of these things is figuring out whether you've got the things or not. I looked up what colors I should use. Yellow for aphids. Yellow for aphids, blue for thrips. So at the time, I thought I had thrips. And what I did was I have blue painter's tape, and I have some of the white stuff. And we put olive oil on the outside yes, of it. I Yep. Sticky just means that you can make it stick to it. It's a great way to tell how much in the way of critters you have coming in because, you know, so if you had a yellow piece of paper and you put olive oil on it, it'd be the same sort of thing. They'd be attracted to it. You could see them stuck there and you'd know that you have them. One of the things you want to do when you're dealing with pests in your garden or your greenhouse is you really want to have an integrated approach to 
how you deal with them. Mm -hmm. The first thing is you need to have a way of monitoring what's going on. In our greenhouse, we've used blue painter's tape, We've used various kinds of other traps. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have any aphid traps right now. I think we'll probably end up getting some. Yeah. And I say, okay, the simple thing to do is remove that one leaf. If you were to put a piece of paper under that leaf as you went to move it, you'll find that a whole stack of those aphids are dropping straight down. So actually putting a piece of paper, if you can, underneath it is a great way to help control that. But what they're doing is a significant percentage of the darn things will drop off the leaf as you remove it. And you're wondering, well, I took that off. Why do I have all these aphids back? Well, it's because they never left. They just fell on the soil surface and then climbed back up the plant. There's a lot of ways to deal with the pests once you've found them, once you've identified them and you know how many you have. A lot of people will swear by planting repellent crops or using, as Irene said, uh, some kind of essential oil. The problem is you need to figure out what's going to work in your area. Mm -hmm. For example, um, we attended a meeting last weekend where the people who were presenting on permaculture advocated planting onions to repel deer. And that works in most of the U.S. Deer don't like alliums. They mm -hmm. just don't eat them. But we've seen them eat onions here. I mean, literally... As in big chomp, uh, yeah, they're, they're sweet onions, but they're still onions, and I sure wouldn't want to chomp one. Early in the season in particular, I literally go out and flip over every leaf. When the plants are still small and you're only dealing with, you know, eight or ten leaves, you can flip over every leaf. You can look for any nymphs, because nymphs is the stage where you want to get all these guys. They're soft-bodied at that point. They are susceptible to anything you put on them, and they're squishable very easily. Learn the signs and warning signs is the best way to put it, of all the different critters in your area. And more important, learn the good guys too. Yeah, beyond using soap and water, mm -hmm. there are other topical applications that we do. For example, neem oil. Right. We use neem oil in the greenhouse. Last year we didn't have to use it a whole lot. We use it some out here in the garden. Right. But it works primarily on, in fact I think only on, the soft body larval or uh, it will it will stage. screw up some of the other guys too. It'll get flea beetles and stuff even as adults because it clogs up the air holes on the side of their bodies. But neem is one of those things that you have to read the fine print on and you have to use it judiciously. In other words, it'll also kill beneficials if you spray during the day. Yeah, so don't don't spray during the day. No, wait wait until it we wait until it's dark. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot the bees go to bed at some reasonable hour. And it's usually before sunset. A lot of times for us, because of our schedule, we actually wind up out there with a headlamp. And <laughs> it's works. really not that big a deal. I mean, you know, I prefer to have better light, but I also prefer to have my beneficials. Bees and all that other kind of stuff. Yeah, it's very benign for most of the beneficial insects. But what it does is it affects chewing insects. So those guys are chomping your leaves. The same as tomato hornworms. They're also chomping your leaves. So if you spell, spread BT out there, and you normally, it's usually what they call a wettable powder, which means it will, if you shake it up, it'll dissolve in water and you spray it. That's what we, we get those little cheapy sprayers from Harbor Freight that uh, hold half gallon half each. Gallon, right and uh, pump them up pump and they up, spray nicely. Right. Yes. I prefer to use something that's totally specific whenever possible. So BT for the, uh, for the chewing insects out there. Now, we mentioned earlier, aphids are not a chewing insect. They're a sucking insect. But we have recently found another bacillus that it is used for aphids. And we're going to actually be experimenting with that this year because it's supposed to be it's supposed to do good for aphids and thrips. And I mean, this long list of all kinds of other stuff. And I'm like, ooh, it's all the bad guys that we... <laughs> yeah, we'll put, we'll put the information in the show notes yeah. so that... We don't get anything from these people, but we love them. And yeah. Arbico in Tucson uh, yeah. ships live predatory insects. Yes. They ship uh, nematode, beneficial nematodes. Yeah. So far, we've talked about using soap and water. Mm -hmm. You remember, your mom probably told you, wash your hands. Mm -hmm. Well, in this mm -hmm. case... You Watch your plants. <laughs> I recommend that you go to something like an Arbico or a Hoss Tools or something 
and check out their lists because they, they have, have huge chart lists, lists. Huge lists. Yeah. Charts, yeah. That that tell you what what to use against which insect. Insects. Yes. Let's talk about predatory insects. One of them is the assassin bug. Right. And they're kind of a aggressive looking bug. Uh, but they look similar to some other not good right. insects. But they're a little more slender, so don't think they're a squash bug. Look at them more closely and you'll see that they're actually not a squash bug. But they do a great job. And you can buy them. That's one of the things that Arbico sells. And they're, they're less affected by heat than the ladybugs are, so if we got them, like when if it gets hot suddenly in the greenhouse, sometimes our ladybugs will just really go away. But there's other things like the um, pirate bugs and the uh, wasps and predatory I like, wasps. I like the lace wings. Yeah. Now, I have not had great luck with lace wings. Yeah, I'm very careful with them. Like, if I do find any or if they get into the house, I'm always like, <laughs> taking them outside go, eat something out there, you know? There are options that you can use. Now, when we're getting ready to try... Is Botanigard 22WP. It always sounds very good. I, I made sure to print this out. Yeah. Um, because it is another fungus that infects the aphids. And I've seen the pictures, and they're just all covered with this white fuzz. It's actually a white muscadine disease. So with muscadine is grapes, obviously. We don't grow grapes here, so I'm not too worried about that. Well, we don't grow muscadines for sure. No, I don't even care for muscadines that much. One of the things to keep in mind about predatory insects is that they can't be shipped at certain temperatures. Yes. So if it's going to be really cold, like it's been for the past couple of days mm -hmm. in much of northern Arizona, the companies will tell you, contact us because we're not sure when we're, when we're going to be able to ship. Find out what you have in your garden and figure out what you want to do about it. There are people who will totally ignore aphids and things like that. And, you know, at the end of the season, I may look at a pepper plant and go, I'm going to hit that with some water, or I'm going to squish those bugs and not worry about it because the plant's mostly done, and it's not worth it, and I prefer not to spray. At the beginning of the year, I'm going to have a more draconian attitude. I'm going to know that, even though here it talks about the fact that, that they name aphids after the specific critter that they usually attack. I don't care what they name it. Yeah. I just care they're on our plants. Yeah. And the chances are, if they're on one plant around here, like the black aphids that show up on the fava beans are probably the same black aphids that show up on the peppers and probably the same ones that grow up on the weeds. There's insects in our area that are going to come that you can't stop. Right. All you can try to do is know that they're there, try to control them as best you can, just be aware of what the specific products that you use requires yeah. for a depuration time. That is the time that you need to leave the crop set right. before you harvest it. Most of them require one or two days yeah. that we will use. Others will require two weeks. Right, and some things you're only allowed to use, it'll say in the instructions. And for gosh sakes, don't throw away the instructions, read them. Yeah, don't, <laughs> don't, don't do like some YouTubers do and they have the instructions come and they... Yes, instructions. I'm a big manly man. I don't need these. And <laughs> they throw them away. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, it, yes, you do. Follow gonna... them. It's really, really important. Yeah. Well, you know, they, they're there for a reason. There are some, some types of plants that you can use some products, like a neem oil, on three or four times before you harvest it. Others, they recommend you only use it a couple of times before you harvest it. One of the reasons we're currently attracted to the Botanigard 22WP is because it is a bacillus and you can use it up to the day of harvest and you don't have to worry about it it's not it's not toxic to people it's not toxic to pollinators so that's the kind of stuff we're looking for we want to be as non-invasive as possible in terms of our chemical use and we want to not have to sit there and go oh i can't harvest this today i can't harvest it for another two days because i sprayed this stuff on it you may not recognize that neem oil comes in several different forms mm -hmm. based on how the oil is extracted from the plant. Mm -hmm. There is cold pressed, which keeps the temperature down. It doesn't get as much oil out of the mass as other techniques, but you have a higher percentage of the active ingredient in the neem oil. Right. The next one is expeller pressed. This is the same things that they do with regular cooking oils, by the way. If you get a cold-pressed olive oil or a cold-pressed 
uh, sunflower oil, it's more expensive. An expeller is a screw. A screw. That and it runs, creates heat. It, it, it runs the seed or other matter through a long tube. Right. And it creates pressure, and that pressure creates heat. That has a better extraction efficiency for the oil. Right. And that's okay. But it also changes the oil. And it, and it also reduces the amount of the active ingredient in the resulting oil. And the last one is either steam or solvent-based extraction. And steam is fine if you're looking for extracting lemon oil mm -hmm. or orange oil. Right. Those are fine, but don't go looking for steam extraction, extraction for neem. And definitely don't go with a solvent based because that's mostly done with hexane, which is a petroleum product, which is not good for you. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the recovery process for hexane is not complete. So there's always some there's hexane always residue. left in the oil. Right. So you know what? Now we're going to say goodbye. Yes. So be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell because obviously we've been doing a lot of homework. And uh, we will keep you apprised of what this, so you can learn from our experiences. And uh, yeah, until next time. Bye. Bye. Keep brainstorming. Yeah, because obviously we are. <laughs> well, you know, we just keep on reading up on the latest, greatest stuff. Yeah. Because we want to tell you about everything that we've learned that's new. And if I can find something like a bacillus that's non-toxic to all the goodies and only zaps the baddies... It's my idea of a good win. Bye.